the first one is Benny Machini. He is the CTO of Airware, and he'll tell us a little bit about what it's like working there. Yeah. Thanks, uh, thanks for having me. Um, I want to try to get through this in, in maybe like 15 or 20 minutes and leave some time for questions if you're curious about startups and drones and, and all that fun stuff. So uh, Airware is a roughly 80-person venture-backed startup um, just across the Bay Bridge in San Francisco. And we're building um, a hardware, software, cloud platform for uh, what we call commercial drones, which is, is kind of a new thing. Um, so, so I'll get into what we're making and kind of tell the story of, of how the company came about and, and how our product has evolved. Um, a little bit about my background, um, not as recently as about three years ago, um, I spent 10 years at MIT, um, six of which I was working in the aerospace controls lab um, at MIT and doing like aerial robotics research. Um, I, this is, these are sort of along the years of all the robots that I've built and have had to maintain. Um, this is when we started flying in indoor motion capture spaces. Um, this was a battery swap and recharge station um, where the vehicle would basically land a new battery would go in autonomously, and we could do like 24-hour like human-free missions, um, which was great. Um, these are way more reliable than undergrads actually to like come in and change batteries, um, which was cool. Um, this was a, a variable pitch quadrotor. Um, there are all these really cool videos coming out of UPenn's Grasp Lab, and we try to think how can we make cooler videos. And so we put um, variable pitch actuation on a, a multi-rotor so that it could actually do like half flips and, and some cool sort of aerobatic stuff. Um, this is a video from uh, my, my PhD thesis, which was a um, kind of like a Bayesian non-parametric um, sub-goal interpretation of uh, actually some of Peter's work in inverse reinforcement learning, um, where uh, you basically learn sub-goals from demonstration. Um, the the thing that all these had in common was like every robot you see here, I had to like ma manually like go to the machine shop, cut it out. Um, get, I was making PCBs, doing firmware, um, you know, spending basically eight percent of my time on building robots and using them, and, and twenty percent of the time actually testing the algorithmic stuff that. Um, that I wanted to test. Does anyone here work in robotics? So yeah, so, so you know, so this is not a surprise. So designing, building, and fixing hardware and software for aerial robots is just soul-crushing, tedious work. Um, and the thing that popped out of this was that I, I thought, hey, someone should make a platform that makes autonomous flight easy, um, but, but still allows me to customize it. And this would have been great when I was a grad student. I would have loved something like this. Um, so when I was an undergrad, I met this guy, Jonathan, um, who's the now CEO of Airware. And we were on, this is a picture actually from the undergraduate UAV team um, where we had met. He was working in California at Boeing. Um, I was in grad school at MIT. And, and we had both worked on this cool Boeing helicopter called the A160, um, which the, the project ultimately failed. But really cool helicopter, lots of cool capabilities. Um, and if you're wondering how startups kind of like start, um, they usually just start with email. So, so we kind of started emailing each other and saying, hey, like, you know, I would really like this platform. I was thinking about it from the sort of research side. And he was thinking about it from uh, more from the business side, and you know, eventually we, we say, hey, let's build something where you know the we've got nice you know position orientation data, but you can code whatever kind of autopilot you want. We thought that that's what people want was like an open source autopilot, and this was in 2008, uh, a while ago. So, so I was in grad school. He was working at Boeing. We were kind of flying across the country. We do like these weekend hackathons, and eventually we we ended up building um, this this product line of uh, of open source autopilots. Um, this was this was the data sheet, and it looks it looks really janky um, compared to to what you, would be a professional data sheet. Um, but the the concept was pretty simple. Um, it was basically a a, a core board down here, um, which which had like the sensors and a coprocessor for data fusion. You would run like an extended Kalman filter, bring all the gyros and accelerometers, mag together. Um, in the in the middle, we had um, I don't know if anyone's used this thing called a gum sticks. It's a little bit outdated by now, um, but a little tiny tiny computer. Um, that we basically put right in the center, and this would run all the flight controls and the applications. This is where you would customize the uh, the actual system, um, and then on top, this would be like an application-specific breakout board. Um, and so, you know, we had three of these different application-specific boards. This was like a really tiny one. Um, this was one for multi-rotors and what we called research, um, and then this was one for fixed wing. So, so we put this together basically on our free time, um, and we went, we took it to a trade show, and you know, to, to try to sell them, and no one bought. And he, we, we made zero sales, um, and people were, and they, they kind of, they looked at us and said, "Well, it's great that you have this um, this autopilot, but um, I, you know, there's lots of different types of aircraft. I actually don't want to code my own autopilot, like for, and this is for business. And this is uh, one of the lessons that I've learned is that um, moving from uh, sort of academia to uh, the industry, um, you need to get closer and closer to sort of like a solution, like something that actually means someone to something, and not just yourself as the grad student who." hated rewriting uh, sensor drivers. 
So, so we took it to there, didn't make any sales. So this was kind of, uh, this is like a slide I'll kind of add to this, is like the, how, the, how the platform has evolved. Um, so we started with that and, and we said, well, there's tons and tons of different types of vehicles. This is the thing we learned right away. Um, and those three solutions, even though they were kind of modular, didn't really work to fly all of them. Um, and so what we decided to then do, and at this time we were kind of, uh, we were in Y Combinator, um, got a Series A raise, and so now we can actually like hire people to like bring them on um, and develop stuff. So we developed this sort of like next generation where we have what we call the Flight Core, which is the um, same thing. It's like the autopilot. Um, it's got Excel's, gyros, magnetometer. It has a static pressure sensor, um, embedded processor that we run real-time operating system on. Um, but then we broke everything else out into modular components, so like a GPS module or an airspeed module, which you don't always need. You only need these on fixed wing. Um, the different types of data links, like sometimes you just want like a low bandwidth serial link. Sometimes you might need an IP, um, a higher bandwidth IP link, and an actuator module because all of the actuators on these things are all completely different. The ESCs took different, um, you know, different control protocols. There might be servos. Um, so we, and we linked all these together over a CAN network, control area network. Um, and, and this is another sort of stopping point where, uh, if you guys use robot operating system, Ross, if you use, Ross is like the, this like is the most amazing concept. The, the importance of pub sub RPC middleware, like basically the, the connective tissue that sends messages, is is really really important. So at one point we we'd made all these things and we and we stopped. We didn't actually make these system diagrams in the beginning. Um, we probably should have done that. But we made a system diagram um, and we so this is like literally all of the each one of these is like a software module which like might be a thread or, or like a, a, some type of module in code, and they all have to talk to each other. And this is, this is on one um, embedded oper like real-time operating system. These are other ones that are um, connected via this like weird CAN protocol, and then there were some actually on the ground. And so that if you, if you had just sort of done ad hoc communication between all these things, it, it would have been a total disaster. So middleware, really, really important in robotics, as you probably already know if you were an applied roboticist, um, super important. We ended up writing our own middleware. It took a little while. So eventually, um, we released this product. Checking the time, OK. Uh, we released this product, um, in, integrated into a customer, couple customer vehicles, and a few people bought it. So maybe like four or five people ended up like buying this because it was modular enough to go into different vehicles. It also flew fixed wing, which was cool. Um, still turned out not to be enough. Um, and one of the things that was holding us back um, was the, the user interface. So. Uh, and I have a theory. So engineers want so badly to be robots that the interfaces they design when they design them, I think, are only made for robots. Like there's only, like there is no way a human can interpret the amount of information that is typically on these user interfaces. Um, and this was like the state of the art. Like these are real. Like this is this is from, is it this one? This one is from a forty thousand dollar autopilot system. Like this is the user interface for it. Like the. I don't even know what the manual looks like for this thing. But anyway, this was holding people back because ours looks similar because we let engineers design the user interface. So human-robot interaction, like this is a very, um, a, a very delicate thing because this is where your product touches the, the user of the product. Um, so, so we hired some people who were more used to designing like video games. Um, and we ended up making a ground control station and this really nice configuration manager software. Um, configuration is an important thing because this is one way that you can crash. Um, airplanes is by misconfiguring them. Um, so we did this. Um, this is just a really quick video of kind of what it looks like. Um, we have like a, basically a design person. Like there's people who like actually know about user interfaces and design. Um, and so we, we said to our engineers, no, you're not allowed to, to make this. We're going to actually give it to someone who knows what they're doing um, and made this really nice user interface um, that can do things like surveying and planning. And this is the thing that ultimately the user is um, interacting through to see, um, to essentially see what's going on. Uh, so this was, this was great. Um, and this, this sort of connected our product to the actual users um, and, and you know, started selling more that way. Because now um, that application that you just saw was basically uh, surveying. It was surveying a, an area of land. Um, and this is like one of the top applications for commercial drones. Um, so important user interface. Still um, wasn't enough because some customers said, well, um, maybe I want to go beyond surveying. Maybe instead of a, a regular EO camera, I want to use an IR camera. Or maybe I don't want to follow your um, sort of survey pattern. I want to design you know, some high level flight controls algorithm that will do it differently. Um, so then what we did was design um, an application framework. So if you've used ROS, like this, this slide will look pretty familiar. Um, the one thing that's different is that since, since we're making a commercial product, like a, this robotics product that we're selling to people, um, if people screw up using it, 
then in, in a way, like the company is kind of liable for that. So, so if we make it really easy for you to you know, take your system and accidentally fly it over SFO or you know, crash into a public park, um, then we are partially liable, um, despite any kind of like contracts you sign. So, so one thing we did was separate like everything that was flight critical on one side, and this is closed source. Um, it runs a real-time operating system. It's all airware software. Um, it's compliant and certifiable. And, and we basically like put a firewall in between, and we said, okay, like if you want to develop applications, do whatever you want to do, but it has to be on this side of the line. Um, and so going this way, you've got data um, like telemetry data, so like the position, velocity, state estimation, um, battery status, um, anything like that. And it, we basically we made a um, a flight controls interface, which is like a high level interface where um, you essentially, if you're an application, so if you're one of the software apps over here. You can request control of the aircraft. You're not necessarily um, granted it. And then once you've uh, been granted control, you send it what we call maneuvers, um, also known as flight primitives. Um, these have been around for a little bit, but uh, they're basically high-level things. So you know, go to go fly to this waypoint at this speed, um, as opposed to giving low-level control, which we found really quickly was like super dangerous to give to users who didn't know what they were doing in terms of flight control. Um, so so we made this application side. This is an actual. Um, this is a computer. It's just a quad-core Intel Atom computer. Um, we, we just put Ubuntu Linux on here because one of the other challenges in, in applied robotics is getting the right software packages from everywhere. Um, and so uh, good package management, super important. Um, we, we put some middleware that connected all these things together. So um, you could write apps on board. Uh, you could write apps on the ground on that uh, plugin in that user interface um, that I showed you earlier. And they all talk through the same sort of pub sub RPC middleware that uh, we try to make it as easy as possible to do that. Um, tight but protected, as I said, integration with the flight control system. Um, so it's the, the flight core's job not to let the user do anything stupid, um, which is pretty hard, actually. Um, and, and then you know, this will allow you to, this has like USB and Ethernet and all that good stuff. So, so if I have like a LiDAR or you know, an IR camera um, or a transponder, um, it's easy to plug it into here. And then I can write an app that will essentially wrap around that device, just like in ROS, and uh, essentially expose it to the system in a standardized way through this middleware. Um, so this is sort of um, our solution to, uh, to allowing people to customize the system, um, but not allowing them to break it. Um, and this is not perfect yet, but um, sort of along the, the right line. So, so we made that, um, and, it turned, and you know, this, this satisfied the, requir you know, the requirements of more people, but it turns out that wasn't enough. Um, and what you're noticing is we're kind of getting like closer and closer to, um, to a person who wants to actually make money with the system, right? Is it, as a roboticist, like I've, I've, you know, I, I thought that this would be plenty. This was like really cool to me. Uh, but the people who are actually using these systems um, have much higher level understanding. Um, so, one more thing that's kind of missing um, is a is obviously it's a San Francisco startup, so we have a cloud platform. Um, so, so is it essentially a, a a cloud platform that ties everything together. So, as the as the business operator, I know that I like I want this field surveyed every two weeks. Um, but I don't know anything about the actual vehicle that's going to do it, or even the person that's going to do it. Um, so what this cloud, um, what the sort of cloud platform whoops, enables you to do, well, I think I broke it. There we go. Um, what the cloud platform enables you to do is have someone in like a planning office, and that doesn't know anything about drones. Um, essentially, plan a you know survey this field or take data from this structure, um, plan all that out, and sort of specify what needs to happen and when. Um, and that will get automatically synced down to the person who's using uh, the user interface, that ground control station that I showed you. And that person doesn't have to know the higher level business objectives. They basically just say, OK, I know that I need to survey this area. They survey it. We shoot for complete autonomy. So um, if, if there's no human involved at all, like that's the ideal situation, um, because humans are difficult to trust. Data gets sent back up to the cloud. And then from here, we can connect that to actual like, data processing packages. Um, this is one called PIX4D. Uh, this is using a uh, structure from motion. Uh, it's a technique called photogrammetry, where it takes two-dimensional pictures um, from different vantage points and will generate like what is a fairly detailed 3D model um, of uh, of, a, of a field. In this case, where you can like measure water levels, you can measure crop growth or density. Um, there's lots you can do with with this kind of thing. So, so finally, we've gotten all the way um, to sort of where we are today, um, where we started with this really geeky, you know, sort of like autopilot that I wanted as a grad student. Um, and, and sort of gone all the way through to something that actually touches the customer and is useful. Um, so, so I, as a quick sort of like, you know, that was this was like evolutionary. So this is this is how things actually happen in the real world. I, a sort of alternative interpretation of this is, um, you've got like the the inputs to the system, which are aircraft and sensors. We don't make these things, um, and then 
you have on the very far away a paying customer who is paying for something useful. Um, and so you can think of filling in the gaps in these things. So you have a service provider who has to integrate the aircraft and the sensors. They have to plan the jobs. Um, and then you have an operator who there's some data collection workflow and they have to safely and reliably operate these things, um, collect the right data, and then get it back up to someone who's going to do data analytics and make data products. Um, and then someone's going to pay for the data products. Like they're, not, they're not paying for the drone. They're not paying for you know, the cool autonomy or the nice application framework. They're paying for the data. Um, and so if you think about the different things, that this is the actual, these are the things that we've connected in a sort of evolutionary sense. Um, but thinking about it in a product sense, um, our platform will integrate this stuff together. Um, and again, lots of, lots of cool sort of uh, firewalling and autonomy to prevent users from doing anything silly. Um, there's a data planning workflow in the cloud, um, setting up vehicles. There's this whole thing, too, in collecting data. It's actually a pretty difficult process when you get down to it. Um, configuring vehicles, um, and then a nice user interface. And in case you're curious, so as, as, as I assume budding roboticists, um, there's lots of places where um, you can, like, application development for these things are, are really important. So um, lots of different things in terms of integrating sensors, um, integrating different types of sensors, writing better drivers, um, tons and tons of, of opportunity in data analytics. Um, so taking data that's collected from drones uh, and turning them into useful things. Um, and, then, and then lots of stuff, um, probably not as related to robotics, but lots of things in the cloud that represent, like, huge business value, like just the... One customer said, well, if, if you draw a geofence, which is like this fence that the aircraft can't fly around, and you can just make it so that one of my managers can approve it before it gets sent down to the operator, like that would be absolutely huge. And, and so that's like a really simple feature, but um, hasn't existed before. So, so lots of opportunity for innovation there. Um, I have, I'm going to spend like four more minutes and just go through some, some interesting applications and, and maybe how, um, where some robotics research can kind of come in and, and make them a little bit better. Um, and then open it up for, for questions, because I'd love to, to hear your thoughts. Um, so wildlife surveying, um, we actually did a deployment to uh, Kenya, uh, to the old Pejeda Conservancy, to do anti-poaching operations with drones. Um, so the way that this used to be done is they would have a pilot just literally fly around in like a Cessna, and it's really hard to hang on to pilots because um, this is boring, and no one wants to actually do this, and you know, someone has binoculars and, like, a, and a clipboard. Um, so, so we actually sent one of our fixed-wing systems to Kenya, and. Uh, did the same thing, and, and the, initial, the initial thing was we wanted to look for poachers. Um, poachers, it turns out, are really, really hard to find. Um, they're extremely, um, extremely sneaky. And so we didn't find any poachers, unfortunately. But when the, when the Conservancy staff saw some of the imagery we were getting, especially like the IR imagery, um, they said, well, we could, we could do accounting. We, we can actually do, um, we can count animals and, and do sort of like population analytics much more rapidly and easily. And we don't need to hire a pilot. Um, and so now they are looking into using drones for actually just surveying uh, the wildlife. Um, lots of cool um, opportunities for sort of like analytics and, and algorithms here. Um, change detection is a huge thing. So one of the ways we kind of hypothesized we could actually find poachers was to do um, really detailed change detection on the roads and, and like to, because to, to find like where they, they camp. Um, they're most interested in is like how they're getting into the park. Um, so, so taking large data sets, doing change detection would be cool. Um, image processing to, you know, this, this is actually an elephant. You can like, kind of see its trunk. But if you can identify these things in an automated way um, using computer vision, um, there are lots and lots of applications for that. Um, search and rescue. So avalanche rescue is really, really dangerous right now. And you're, you're sending more people um, to, to search for one lost person and putting a lot of people at risk. So you can imagine using one drone or just using a bunch of drones um, to automatically deploy over a wilderness area and save the save the, the actual you know, rescuers the time and effort of searching for the person and, and focus more on their rescuing of, of the victims. Um, lots of cool opportunities for sort of autonomy here in terms of uh, coordinated control and planning um, and sort of like cooperative you know, autonomous agents doing a search over a really large area. Um, infrastructure inspection is, is this problem where um, even across the entire country, uh, there's, have you ever seen one of these machines before? Who has seen one of these before? These are the machines that inspect the bridges that you drive on every day. And the fact that you have never seen one before, to me, was a little bit scary. Um, that means because, because what that means is that they're not inspecting bridges very often. Um, and, and, there's a, and it's really it's dangerous. Um, drones would be a way, way more scalable and better way to do this, um, but actually introduces a lot of interesting technological problems. So um, when you fly under a bridge, um, you obviously don't have GPS, and you know that you know in order to do control for these systems, you need to know uh, you know where you are, position and velocity estimations. 
So once GPS goes away, kind of all bets are off on that. And the inertial sensors that you use in here are so bad that the, the estimate drifts very quickly. Um, so one of the cool algorithms, um, we're, we're working on sort of using vision um, to get a position velocity estimate. There's some really cool stuff with monocular uh, vision, uh, one, called, one algorithm called SVO that a lot of people are using. Um, lots of cool stuff for using stereo odometry. Um, and one of the interesting problems here, and I, I saw on your lecture list, um, unscented common filters was one, of the, uh, was one of the lecture topics. Those things are awesome. They work really, really well. Um, and especially in applications like this where you have sensor data of like very different types, um, a flexible filter, um, like an unscented comet filter, um, is, is in, in practice seems to work very well for bringing these things together. Um, great. Uh, quarry accounting, this is another simple thing. This is the way, when, when, you're, when you're operating a quarry, you need to know how much volume of rock you've taken out, and so that, that way you charge the people who are actually getting the rock. Um, this is the way that they do it right now. There's little guys that like walk around with sticks and they measure the altitudes of different planes. Um, super, super manual. You saw that 3D model that I showed you um, earlier. You can just fly a multi-rotor. It takes like 10 minutes to do an entire quarry and get an, an extremely detailed um, terrain elevation model. And this, uh, this, is, this like changes the quarry accounting by like an order of magnitude um, in terms of precision. So now um, you can do this on a much more regular basis for a lot cheaper. And it, it actually saves quarries money because they know more precisely um, how much they're taking out and they can do better planning and accounting. Um, Structural assessment, this is a really interesting one too. Um, these, are, these are real um, images from uh, Vijay Kumar's group uh, at UPenn at the Grass Lab, where they went to um, Japan after an earthquake and they took um, their, their sort of like slam um, aerial robot to, to actually map out an entire building. Um, so you can imagine doing this uh, right after a, a natural disaster and be before first responders go in, if a, if a robot could map that building and determine whether it was safe to enter or start to identify like where, um, where there were you know victims, um, this this would be a huge application and and requires um, I don't know if if your class covers sort of like simultaneous localization and mapping, but this is a, a really great application uh, for SLAM algorithms um, and and lots of lots of really cool sort of like algorithmic robotic things um, that go into being able to um, map an unknown environment and navigate within it um, at the same time. Um, a couple other examples, telecom satellites, this is less on the algorithm robotic side. And people actually want to put these drones at like 60,000 feet because um, it's really hard to get stuff into space and it always will be. Um, so this would be a low cost way to do that using drones. And then sort of gas leak detection where right now this guy literally has to go right up to a gas thing and, and see if it's leaking um, and you can imagine um, basically flying over an entire area and collecting gas samples um, and using some sort of like predictive, um, uh, predictive, you know, model predictive uh, algorithms to figure out, you know, where there might be a gas leak so that you can, you can sort of target the, um, the inspection. So, so that was a lot, um, but I want to get any questions from you guys in the last, uh, the last few minutes. Oh, thank you. Yeah. yeah. You had that uh, slide that yeah. going from there to the customer. Yep. Would you be doing this last step of the service provider? What, um, so, so what we found is that to, to do this whole thing, the, the first time, pretty much we, like we need to do it. So, so for the first time you do an application, we need to kind of take it all the way from like proof of concept and prototyping all the way through to like a, an initial system. And then from there, someone can take it over. Um, and this is one of the actual sort of changes. Um, we've, we've started focusing a little bit more on uh, providing a a full solution for, for customers uh, the first time that you do something uh, because we're since we designed all this technology we're kind of the best at using it and so um, it's kind of one of the fun parts of my job. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Say you're a farmer. Mm -hmm. You've done the mapping, right? So as a farmer, could you uh, just go online and say this rectangle, please map it out this often, and then someone who from Airware will, I guess, show up with a drone and fly and then. You get the data? Yeah, that, that's the idea. And there are some companies that actually, oh, there's companies that do it already with, uh, with manned aircraft. So um, in, there's, a, there's a company that will fly their Cessna over like Napa Valley and Sonoma, just, just constantly, and they'll collect data for the entire valley. Um, and then farmers will go online and sort of, they'll say, okay, well, I want to purchase the data from like the last few months. Um, 
doing it with a drone is better because you can get closer and, and you can do more, more precise change detection essentially, which is kind of the, the key is, is looking at changes in uh, the sort of like multi-spectral reflectance uh, of the crops. Um, so, so yeah, that, that's really close actually. Um, it's just pretty exciting. Any other questions? Yeah. So the companies don't purchase the actual power. They, like, the idea is that you only sell to them some data. Like they say, I want you to give me the data relative to this, and then you collect it and you sell the data, but not at all the hardware or anything, so they can do it themselves, right? That's a well. So that's a good. I mean, it's an open question, and, and we're not. No one has really taken drones and, and scaled them. Like there's there's no. There's no like GE of drones yet where there's like a really good model for how things are going to scale. Um, so in one model, there's one company that does everything and they just sell the data, which is what you described. Um, in another model, uh, maybe a more scalable model would be we sell full systems to service providers and then and, and charge them a subscription um, for using it and then they sell the data. So there's actually different ways of doing it and we haven't quite figured out what one is going to be the best yet. I don't think anyone has. Yeah. Um. In terms of cost uh, now, and maybe if you have a, a, a course in the future, what's the most expensive part? Like the acquisition of the data or the actual analytics? Uh, I'm seeing that probably now is the first part because it's hard, but like it might quickly switch that it's negligible the, the price of acquiring the data compared to actually analyzing. Yeah. So, so just in our experience, the analytics is pretty cheap. Like it's really just you know, AWS server time is really all that it costs you, which is which is super cheap and super scalable. Um, the for us, like definitely like the by far the most expensive part is paying people to develop these solutions. It's it's the cost of, of staff. Um, and so and that's the um, but but I think yeah in the future, I mean there's always gonna be co like cost in the hardware, this stuff was, is gonna break, robots break. Um, and it's sort of commoditizing, but uh, I would say the actual paying people to go collect the data is, is likely going to be the most expensive thing. Are you doing any flight uh, near obstacles? And what kind of, I guess, what are you using to fly close to obstacles? Yeah, so um, we're starting to do flights around towers. So for like, there, there's you know like 800,000 like cell phone towers, and they they need to be inspected twice a year. It takes half a day to do them right now because people are climbing on the towers. Um, so we're starting to fly vehicles around that. Um, we're using uh, an, a monocular camera and doing a visual odometry from video. Um, this. Uh, one, one algorithm called semi-direct uh, visual odometry, which is a really cool paper. You should check it out. It came out of ETH. Um, and then a, a laser scanner to do like basic collision avoidance. Um, but lots and lots of opportunity to, to do more sophisticated things. One cool thing to do would be to fly around the tower at a distance, generate a map, like a 3D map of all the obstacles, and then, and then do trajectory planning within that map. Um, right now, we're just kind of going in and, and not doing mapping. Um, so lots of, uh, lots of opportunity there. Cool. Oh, yeah. yeah. I was curious, maybe I, I miss it on the list of functions that you have integrated in your system, but do you have a battery management system, or, uh, or does it depend on the, on the battery in itself? Yeah, we, we don't right now, and battery technology is one of those things where um, it, the, the batteries that we get sort of at cost are, are these batteries that just come from China, and like we don't know much about them. So this is one of the, and this is obviously like a, a pretty sensitive area in terms of robustness of the system. Um, so yeah, doing like Coulomb counting and, and you know, sort of tracking the, the discharge cycle of the batteries over time um, is something that would add a lot of robustness. Um, not many people are doing that today, though. All right. Well, thank you, buddy. Yeah, thanks, guys.